Welcome everyone to this fourth and final installment of our Knowledge Translation Field School. Uh, excited again to welcome you. Uh, welcome if, if it's the first time you're here. Welcome to the first one. And many of you I'm recognizing names, so welcome back. Um, this is our fourth and final installment of the Knowledge Translation Field School. And for this one, I'm really pleased to introduce Kathy and Marianne. They are our communications whizzes at Brock University, um, and they've put together a, uh, a session for us today, a workshop on uh, speaking with and engaging the media um, in, in kind of research context. So um, I've been through these workshops with these folks at Brock. I know they're super useful and they're uh, really helpful to just break things down and think about the process of um, engaging with media. So I'm really excited to loop everyone into that today. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Kathy and Marianne. Uh, thank you both so much and I'm looking forward to this session. Great, thank you for having us, Kyle. Um, very much looking forward to, to sharing some insight into, uh, into the benefits of uh, engaging media and really just working to get your work out there. Um, so I will share my screen. All right. Can everybody see that okay? Kyle, can you give me a thumbs up? Yes, that's Good? perfect. Wonderful. All right, um, so uh, as Kyle said, uh, my name is Marianne St. Dennis. So I'm the manager of content and communications at Brock. Um, and my colleague, Kathy Mightney is also here to uh, to share some insight. We're gonna go through uh, a, a variety of different ways in which you can engage with media, um, you know, the, the different uh, benefits that you'll see uh, through engaging media and also um, just learning to get your message out there in a way that broad audiences can understand. So just a bit of an overview uh, for what we what we're going to go over today. Um, so we're we're going to dive into the media and its changing landscape. Um, the media landscape has changed considerably over the past, you know, 15, 20 years um, and is continuing to evolve. So we'll get into that a little bit. Um, we're going to talk about the benefits of sharing your research in the public domain. Uh, you know, why, why you should, why you should share your work um, and also the supports that are available to help you do that. Um, you'll hear me say multiple times throughout this presentation, um, you are not alone in doing this. Um, you know, there are supports available to you. There are um, professional communicators uh, available, whether you're working through a university or another organization. Um, it's, it's fairly rare nowadays that organizations, um, for organizations to not have communications professionals on staff. Um, so just know that there are people there to support you along the way. We'll talk about uh, how to best tell your story and the various avenues that you can take um, in order to do that, and also about the importance of strategic timing. Um, <clears throat> you can really tell a story at any time uh, throughout, whether it's your research cycle or throughout the year, um, but being strategic with your timing can help that message to go farther. Um, and so we're really here to help you share the ways in which, um, you know, we can help that work to get uh, as much outreach as possible. We'll also get into some specifics of uh, how to get to the root of your message, uh, which in and of itself can be a challenge at times. Um, you know, you are the expert, you've, you've often spent uh, off, sometimes years um, you know, uh, making sure that your message comes together uh, in what is usually a very comprehensive package. So being able to distill that into a very um, relatable and understandable message that anybody can kind of pick up and run with um, is tricky. And it, you know, it takes time to, to figure out how to do that properly. So we're gonna offer you some tips that, that can hopefully uh, get you started on the right foot. We'll also talk about um, how to prepare that message, whether that's for the media or if you're going out and, and um, putting your content out directly to the public, whether social through social media or other avenues. Um, and then we're going to dig into some plain language principles. Um, so that ties in again with just speaking to, to broad audiences uh, and making sure that, you know, they understand what you're talking about, because um, that will also help your work to uh, <clears throat> to go as far as it possibly can. 
We'll talk about what makes a story engaging, um, which is also quite important. And then also, uh, you know, once you've reached out to media, you've landed yourself an interview, now what do we do? <laughs> Where do we go from there? Um, we'll offer some tips uh, to get you prepared in advance, uh, you know, what you can do in the moment and also uh, some post interview advice. And then we'll also talk some troubleshooting. Uh, you know, if you do encounter a difficult situation um, while you're in the middle of an interview or in advance of an interview, what do you do? Um, we'll, uh, we'll dive into that a little bit as well. So the goal really overall is just to help you feel more comfortable interacting with the media, sharing your message, um, you know, understanding what they're looking for so that we can increase the chances um, of you having success with that outreach and getting your message out into the public domain. So we'll start with some basics. Who are the media? Um, I know it's a phrase that we hear a lot these days, you know, the media, um, but it's quite a broad range. Uh, you know, journalists work for a variety of media outlets. We're talking local, national, international media outlets. Um, <clears throat> these are journalists who are every day actively out there. They're looking for content. Um, <clears throat> they are constantly looking for, uh, you know, things to fill newspaper pages, to fill radio airtime, to fill television uh, news space. Um, they are looking for your content. They want to talk to you. Um, you know, we're talking newspapers and magazines, nightly news shows. Uh, uh, there's an abundance now, just like online news sites where you can circulate your work, um, whether directly through the site or through their social media channels, which we'll also talk a little bit about uh, shortly. And then also, um, you know, like talk radio programs, we do get our experts on a lot of talk radio programs. Um, you know, there's a lot of airtime to fill and people want to talk to knowledgeable experts who are either from their community or can contribute to like an ongoing and breaking news discussion. Um, there's a lot of interest out there. Um, so it, it's great to be able to take advantage of those opportunities. So while it may seem like there is there are still an abundance of media outlets out there, um, as I mentioned earlier, the media landscape is changing. And so are we. The way that we are accessing news and consuming news has changed considerably. I mean, the days when most people would wake up in the morning, grab their newspaper and a cup of coffee and sit down and flip through the pages, they're just while there are still people who do that, um, they are fewer and farther between. I'm sure I'm not the only one. I used to be that person. I used to grab my physical newspaper. I used to sit and read through the pages every day. Now it has turned into, you know, I wake up, I do the, the old scroll through the phone. I check my Google alerts. Uh, you know, I go to the common news pages that I like to check. Um, the, the way that we are consuming this news has, has changed quite considerably. Um, and, you know, for some of, some of the maybe the younger people who are in attendance, maybe you've never picked up a physical copy of a newspaper. I, I can't even believe I, I'm saying that, but it happens now. You know, we are to the point where um, the majority of people are accessing all of their news online. Um, so the just the, the methods, the distribution methods um, have have changed substantially. So. Uh, you know, readers are really looking to have news at their fingertips. They want it on demand. They want it in the moment. Um, and they're always looking for that additional story. There's always a need for more content. You know, the feeds are already full. And if people are refreshing and there's not something new, they want to know, you know, what's the what's the next piece? What's the next piece of news coming across uh, coming across my screen? So. Because of all of these changes, it has started to put a strain on traditional media outlets. Competition is really stiff. Attention spans are very short. Um, the amount of time that people are spending on news, even on news stories online, um, are, are quite uh, limited. Uh, when people are clicking through to stories, you know, they're spending maybe a minute, minute and a half, uh, two minutes tops reading through something. So making sure that you are delivering that message in a succinct way is incredibly important. Um, it's something that uh, every newsroom, every communications department, um, something that we're all working through to try and get as much eyes 
as or as many eyes on our content for as long as possible. Um, you know, given that the the market is so saturated. So uh, as I've said, uh, you know, it has started to put a strain on these traditional media outlets. Um, so what what does that look like as they they try to adapt? So this is just an example. Uh, so for print media in Niagara, you can see how much the media landscape has changed in the past 20 years. So we've gone from having, you know, while the number of daily newspapers is the same, the amount of weekly newspapers that we've had has dropped considerably. So we've gone from nine weeklies to three weeklies in the last 20 years. The number of reporters, which is like the key number to look at, we've gone from 50 plus reporters to nine reporters covering the, an entire region of half a million people. <laughs> so, you know, we've got 12 municipalities um, and nine reporters to cover 12 mun municipalities um, and even fewer editors. So, you know, there's a lot of strain in those newsrooms. As a, a, a formal former journalist myself, um, when I started in journalism about 15 years ago, um, the newsrooms were packed with people still, uh, you know, there were, there were reporters for every specific, um, section of the newspaper, you know, you had entertainment writers, you had feature writers, you had sports writers, um, you had photographers who were just photographers and not also writers. Um, and that has just changed completely. Now you're going into newsrooms, there's only, uh, you know, a, a very small handful of people and they are doing everything. They are doing the writing, they are doing the photos, they are doing the social media, um, they are doing all of the web editing. They are, they are a one-stop shop for all of your journalism needs, essentially. Um, and even though there are so many, the, 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 the resources are so limited now, um, but the demand for news content has not slowed down at all. Um, it's still quite high. And so journalists are, you know, they're, they're feeling the pressure. Um, you know, they're, they're still working with really tight timelines. Um, they're working to prioritize stories. There's, uh, there's just so much going on all at once. Uh, the newsrooms themselves are not only downsizing, some of them are closing. Uh, we have communities across Canada that don't have local news anymore um, just because their, their newsrooms have been shut down. Um, even in Niagara, even though we do have three daily newspapers still, we don't have a newsroom anymore. All of the journalists are working from home. Um, you know, they don't have that collective space. And as somebody that has worked in newsrooms in the past, you know, that is where a lot of um, story ideas develop from. You know, you're speaking with your colleagues, uh, you hear about things happening in the community, and that really helps to drum up those story ideas. So that kind of collaboration isn't happening as much as it used to. So it makes it that much more important for us to, to hand over story ideas. You know, when we have ideas, they're looking for those ideas. Um, and so it's great that we keep those connections and continue to, to build those relationships. So what does this change look like and what does it mean? So there are fewer stories being written in general across the board. You know, I know I gave the example of Niagara, but this is not Niagara specific. Communities across Canada are experiencing this. There are fewer stories being written. There are fewer requests. Uh, for interviews with experts, <laughs> excuse me, there are fewer, fewer journalists showing up at university events. Excuse me one second, I'm just going to have some water. I'm just getting over, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a bug. So my throat is, uh, <clears throat> is on its way out. But, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. One second. All right, apologies. <clears throat> so, um, in terms of having fewer reporters out there reaching out to universities, fewer uh, journalists coming to our events. So, even though we're hosting events still, we're not seeing as much media coverage as we have seen in the past. With the cutbacks in the newsrooms, we're also seeing a loss of seasoned journalists. So working with uh, less experienced reporters, 
means they may also have trouble understanding complex research. So this also makes it really important that you're able to deliver that information in a clear way um, to help them understand because you're not necessarily working with somebody who's been in the business and been working for research with researchers for decades. So <clears throat> by being able to continue to build these relationships with uh, reporters, they may be more inclined to work with you again in the future. So when you're working with a less experienced journalist and you take the time to explain things properly, they're more likely to come back to you the next time around because they don't have to do all of that extra work of deciphering exactly what you're talking about. So building that rapport and building that relationship is really beneficial. They're always looking for sources who make their job easier. Their jobs are very difficult right now. And so finding anybody that can help to, to ease that process um, is a big help. It's not, I realize I, I make it sound like it's all doom and gloom. It's not all doom and gloom. You know, there are positives uh, to the changes that we're seeing in the media landscape. So these, like I said, these newsrooms are shrinking, but there's still an ongoing need to fill space in newspapers, online publications, um, even though there are fewer people to create that content. So that's where people like Kathy and I come in. This is where, uh, you know, universities, their communications teams. So our teams really are working to create ready to use packages that we can send to the media. We're trying to make it as seamless as possible where, you know, we're creating stories with photos, often with vid video that we can package together we send it off to the newsrooms and say, you know, if you're looking for content, here you go. This is ready to go. This takes very little effort. You know, we write it within Canadian press style, which is the style that the majority of newspapers across the country use. Um, and we write these stories in a way that are um, understandable to readers. They often follow their style requirements. We try to make things as easy as possible so they can essentially pick it up and paste it into their publications and send it out into their channels. Now, in the days when I was a journalist, we would never do that. <laughs> you know, you would, you would get a press release from a university or from a different organization. You would take that and use that as a basis to do your own interviews, to get your own photos, to create your own videos. Um, but there's not always time for that these days. Um, that certainly does still happen. But uh, we do find like now there are days where, you know, they'll take our content um, and near verbatim, they will use it. Uh, there may be a few modifications, but they're certainly using that as a, a strong basis to build off of uh, <laughs> in order to share that with the community. <clears throat> so in terms of the journalists who are still working in our communities, um, you know, there, there are fewer of them out there, but that's a, an opportunity for us to build stronger relationships. Um, you know, you're working with the same people consistently, um, <clears throat> and that just allows us to uh, continue to build that rapport. So when I mentioned earlier about, you know, having the resources at whether it's your university or your organization, um, it's very likely that your communications team is familiar with the journalists that either are working in your community um, or work with your organization on a regular basis, um, you know, it's very likely that they've been able to build a rapport with those people, um, which definitely helps when it comes to sharing your message and, and getting the word about your research or other stories out there. <clears throat> the changes to the, the media landscape, landscape also mean more opportunities for us to tell our stories in new and interesting ways. You know, in the past, we've been a bit limited on what we've been able to share and put together as packages and what the media would take. And that that has changed. You know, now they're very open to uh, using the different uh, aspects of our work that we're willing to share with them. So, you know, there are different ways that we can share things, but also on our ends, you know, we have more we have more ways to tell stories through our own channels, you know, through our social media channels, um, the use of video, YouTube, um, and different elements like that. Uh, there are a variety of ways that you're able to share things, um, you know, even yourselves, 
<clears throat> even if you're not going through, you know, a university's social media channel, even being able to share your content through your social media channels, um, you know, there's good opportunity to do that as well. Um, and those opportunities are only going to continue to grow. We, we know social media is not going anywhere. <laughs> um, Twitter, Twitter is still up for debate, um, but, but, for the, but for the most part, uh, social media is not going anywhere. Um, so, you know, those opportunities are only going to continue to grow um, as, as that uh, evolution continues. So while the media landscape continues to evolve, the role of media remains the same. They're there to help people become educated and better informed about issues that matter. And your work matters. So we are here to tell you your work matters. I know you you know it matters to you, but it matters to the world as well. And you know that's why the majority of people are doing work in academia. They want to make a difference and help to you know change the world, change society, make a difference in their community. Um, so you should you should share those stories. They're very important stories, um, and your work is important. So take pride in it and and share it. Um, I just very much encourage people to do that. <laughs> So why establish yourself as an expert? I know it can be a little bit intimidating uh, to, to uh, I guess, use the term expert, um, but that's what you are. You know, you are an expert in your field. When you uh, dig into that research, um, you, are, you are the person who has the answers that people are looking for. So, you know, you should definitely embrace that. <clears throat> Sharing your expertise really allows for more opportunities for funding um, and institutional and industry partnerships. Um, there are a lot of people who use their media outreach on grant applications uh, to help draw attention to their work, um, which is a really good, uh, a good way to you know, potentially get more funding. Every interview is another chance to share why your research matters and to highlight the potential implications. So the time to start positioning yourself as an expert is now. I know we have people in a variety of stages of their careers and their, and their research uh, on the call. <clears throat> if, if this is something that you are looking to, to do, you know, there's never a bad time to position yourself, to start positioning yourself as an expert in your field. You know, reach out to your communications team, let them know that you're interested in starting to do media, you're interested in just starting to um, you know get more involved in opportunities like this um, even if you're not to the point where you're able to to share a specific research project or anything along those lines there are always opportunities to get involved um, so I'd encourage you to to reach out to those communications professionals um, that your 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 institution or your organization is affiliated with <clears throat> so it won't matter to the media whether the work is led by a faculty member or a graduate student. I will also mention that um, I know sometimes we have students who may be a little bit uh, intimidated about the idea of going to the media with their research. Um, you know, the, the media, it doesn't matter to them if you are a, a tenured professor or if you are a PhD student, if you're a master's student, if you have interesting research, interesting research is interesting research. Um, all they want to know is the details of, you know, what are you looking at? What does it mean to the world? Um, that That is going to be their key priority. So don't be intimidated. Uh, you know, if you're just getting started in your graduate studies, um, don't be intimidated about uh, going ahead and sharing your work. But I will say, please discuss that with your supervisor before taking any additional steps. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of times that is, that's the first step, you know, chatting with your su supervisor about potentially moving moving forward with some of that. Um, they're also a great resource um, and can help you to connect, whether it's with people at the university in the communications department um, or in other areas that, that might be able to help with those outreach efforts. <clears throat> so again, just remember you are not alone. Um, every university and many public and private organizations have communications teams that can help to guide you along the way and provide support in telling your story. Um, what we do at Brock is echoed at institutions across the country. Um, you know, we write stories, we provide photos, video, media outreach, social media promotions, um, you know, and we're not unique in that. Um, you know, while we, we very much pride ourselves in the work that we do, uh, you know, every, 
every institution across the country uh, has teams like this that are to, here to support people like you. Um, so please take it, take advantage of that knowledge and that expertise. Um, we're here to work with you and we're eager to work with you. So please, please do reach out. <clears throat> And also when you, uh, when you do think that you have an idea for media outreach, um, please reach out as soon as you can. Um, it's important that we get the ball rolling as, as soon as we can so that we can create a plan, um, figure out the best, uh, the best avenues uh, that we can explore with whatever it is that you're working on or whatever the idea is. Um, <clears throat> you know, it may not always be going straight to media, it may be, uh, you know, putting something out through social media and just determining the best channels that may work for you. Um, and so again, just please take advantage of our expertise when it comes to that. Um, we're, we're, our goal is ultimately just to have things uh, get out as far as they possibly can. Um, so we're here to, to, to help you succeed. So when is the right time to tell your research story? A common mistake is thinking that you can only tell a research story once for a specific project. I'm um, here to tell you, please do it more than once. Um, you know, there are opportunities throughout the research cycle to tell your story. Um, and I find that a lot of times people will reach out to us at uh, a certain point throughout their project. Often it's just after a re it's just after research has been published. That's the that's the most common one, <clears throat> where we'll have people reach out and they'll say, "Oh, you know, I've just had this paper published. Um, can we do something on it?" The answer is, of course, yes. But there are also opportunities throughout that research process where we can, you know, do a variety of things to get the word out about your work. Um, you know, when your research first gets funded. We put out uh, a piece about what you are hoping to achieve with this work. As you're looking for research participants, um, this can really help you to target outreach to specific audiences and obviously to get you uh, participants for your work itself. Um, partway through a long project, providing an update is really helpful. You know, say you've got a five year project underway. You know, maybe once a year you do an update letting people know where, where you are. Um, you know, how things have been progressing, where are we going from here? Um, that, that doesn't mean that things can't change as that project continues to progress, um, because it can and it likely will. Um, but it's just a great opportunity to let people know that that work is continuing um, and that, uh, that, you know, there will hopefully be more updates uh, as we go down the road. So again, after your research is published is also a great time um, to do another update. <clears throat> and then at a time where your work is timely, um, I realize that sounds very simplistic, but it's one that I always like to emphasize because I think sometimes people forget that, you know, you have a specific research project, um, but they, they don't necessarily, they don't necessarily link it to things that are happening in the news or they don't necessarily link it to you know the time of year and and what all of that looks like so just to give you some examples um think about think about the impact of organized sports during the back to school season so if you have expertise in organized sports and what that looks like Every year during back to school, there's talk about, you know, bringing sports back, what that means for students. Um, that's a good time to talk about that research. Even if you've talked about it before, um, it's a great time to, to get that word out. Um, so strategically timing things um, can help you to resurface some of that work, uh, you know, bring back a, a project either that you're building on or, um, you know, that, that's still relevant um, after a bit of time. I can also think about, um, you know, what it takes to run a major sporting event as we approach, say, the Super Bowl or, of course, the World Cup. Um, <clears throat> you know, there are there are always people looking to talk about these different el timely elements that are happening as these various events are approaching while they're here um, and in the in the post after they've been completed. 
So being strategic with timing can make a big difference. Um, as I mentioned, aligning a story's release with relevant external events, headline news, or even certain holidays can have a great impact. Um, this is again why it's important to create a plan with your university's communications professionals, you know, reach out, uh, help to make a plan and, uh, you know, get things on the calendar. So you have something to kind of work through. I find uh, a lot of times we're like, oh, this would be great for next year. Next year, we should keep this in mind. You know, you have to make a note to, uh, we keep an annual calendar of different events that, uh, you know, whether they reoccur or, you know, certain times of year back to school, for instance, um, you know, just making note of those times of year where journalists are always looking for rele relevant experts um, can be can be quite helpful. Um, but don't ever be afraid to reach out, you know, if it's if it's September and the following July, you know, something is going to be taking place. I realize that's extremely early, but it never hurts to just drop an email and say, listen, you know, 10 months from now, nine months from now, I think that this would be a really great opportunity. I realize it's incredibly uh, well in advance, but it just, uh, it's great to get it on the radar so that you can get the wheels turning. You can think about different things that we can do to package that content. So different ways to tell your story. There are so many avenues available to tell your stories now, um, which is which is great news. Press releases, of course, um, directly reaching out to the media to draw attention to a research project or to share expert information uh, on a timely topic. News stories. So for instance, uh, at Brock University, we have the Brock News website, which is linked to the main Brock website. Um, it is a site where we essentially tell all of the university's stories, whether they are student stories, research stories, um, you know, our, our content goes out not only to the Brock community, but also the wider community. We do get a lot of pickup um, from the wider community who are just learning to looking to learn a bit about, you know, what's happening at the university. So that's a really good outlet as well. Most universities do have a news website of some kind. Um, they they do vary in, you know, kind of what their strategic priorities are and, um, and, and exactly how they look. Um, but the intention for the most part is the same, just to to share the, the stories of, um, of the university. So sometimes, you know, you may have a project that might not be a good fit for media outreach, um, but you still wanna share it with the community. So that's a really good avenue to do that as well. Um, it also gives you a really good feel for what it's like working with media. So even though we are not the media, we are communications professionals and, uh, you know, we're, we're working on the same team. Um, we we treat our interviews as though you're working with the media um, for the most part, just to give you a feel of the kind of questions people will ask, um, what the process looks like. The only difference is we will work with you to ensure that the story is how you want it to look before it heads out anywhere. So you do get final approval. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that when it comes to uh, traditional media as well a little bit later, but um, but yeah, it's a it's a good way to kind of get a feel for to get a feel for what that media experience can look like. Um, so another important element is opinion columns. Um, so with the shrinking of newsrooms, those are also being more actively sought by media outlets. Um, traditionally, in the past, those have been written by newspapers, um, and that's just not happening as much as it used to, given that there are so few editors. Um, at newspapers these days. Um, so they are always looking for experts to share their opinions. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. <clears throat> so also sometimes a really well-crafted social media post can be just as effective as a media release um, in drawing attention to your work. Um, sometimes we downplay the importance of social media. Um, it's obviously uh, a very important avenue, but the amount of people that you can reach through a successful social media post is unlimited. Um, so it's it can be very beneficial. Um, so I, I would highly recommend uh, using that to your advantage. So also, um, if you are if you're planning on doing any 
work either in a lab, um, you know, if you're doing any field work, um, depending on what your projects look like, um, if you are out in the community doing anything along those lines, it's great to be able to invite the media to come along. Um, this, of course, is not always a possibility, but when it is, um, I definitely encourage you to, to do that um, by working, whether it's through your, your university's communications team or, <clears throat> or through your organization. Having those uh, visually interesting elements uh, will really help to propel your message farther. Um, when people have interesting photos or even video, that are they have to like accompany a piece um it definitely helps to get a lot more eyes on it um photography is a very powerful tool um it's one of the first things that a reader will see whether they're flipping through social media um you know whether they're flipping through a newspaper um a lot of times it is the deciding factor on whether or not they're going to stop and have a look and have a read through uh your work essentially so I'm just going to dive a little bit deeper in a to a few of these avenues. So with press releases, um, sometimes I think we get stuck thinking that the only time we can reach out to media is when we have a specific project that's happening as a, at a specific time. Um, as an expert in your field, you have the knowledge that media are looking for. So if there's something happening in the news that you feel confident speaking to based on the knowledge that you've acquired, through your, whether it's your past research work or your ongoing research work, um, let your communications team know. So this is an example of um, a press release that we put out earlier this year when the uh, Winter Olympics were just, it, it, everything was getting rolling for the Winter Olympics just prior to it getting started. Um, we had a collection of experts who came together for this piece, and they spoke to a variety of angles. Um, so, you, you know, when we're talking about the, Olymp the Winter Olympics, we're not just talking about the actual games themselves. You know, we were talking about sports marketing. Um, we were talking about gender equity. We we're talking about Olympics history. Um, also, the environmental impacts. You know, there are so many ways that you can come at a variety of news stories. Um, so if you see a connection there, definitely reach out to somebody, um, let them know, you know, I think that I can speak to this um, because they, especially with big, big events like this, um, with the Olympics in particular, uh, journalists are always looking for fresh angles to approach these things with, um, you know, there are, there are the obvious angles, and then there are ones that only experts like you can help bring to their attention. Um, you know, they, they don't necessarily know which angles to take until we say, we have an expert that can speak to X, Y, Z. You know, are you interested in pursuing that? So op-eds, um, which of course I, I mentioned uh, just briefly, um, opinion columns for news publications can also be a really great way to get your name out there and your work into the public eye. So they require you to take a stance, um, which some people do find tricky. Essentially, you need to you need to argue a position in an op ed. Um, you are you're not just sharing your work. You are you're taking a stance. You're arguing a point and you're using your expertise and hopefully your research to back it up. So this piece, for instance, um, is by a Brock assistant professor named Taylor McKee. So he, in this piece, he's looking at proposed sports sanctions against Russia in the early days of the war with Ukraine. Um, and in this piece, he's arguing that the world's sport communities must come together unanimously and with a willingness to stick it out for a long period of time in order to affect geopolitical change. So it's very impactful, um, you know, and it's just a way to really express how your work or how you can use your work um, to help impact change. So it's a, uh, op-eds are a really good opportunity that I feel not as many people take advantage of, um, but they're a really good outlet um, to explore if that's something that you're interested in. So major news outlets across the country uh, receive a considerable number of these op-ed submissions a day as well. Um, you can give it a try on your own. Um, typically, most, uh, most papers are looking for something in the range of 650 words, uh, give or take. It does vary depending on the publication. Um, but because the, the word length uh, 
is so specific, um, I would definitely recommend working with communications professionals to help both pitch the piece um, and to edit it for length and um, just ensure that your message and your argument um, is as succinct and concise as possible. So another great outlet for publishing opinion pieces is The Conversation Canada, um, which Kathy is going to expand on a little bit for you. Okay. <clears throat> thank you very much, Marianne. And uh, hi, everyone. It's nice to meet you all. And thank you very much for coming. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's great that you're here. So um, as uh, Marianne uh, segued me into um, the Conversation Canada, you probably you probably have seen it or recognize the banner in, in newspapers or online. Um, it's a daily independent online publication delivering analysis and exploratory journalism from the academic and research community directly to the public. And it's it's published under Creative Commons, so it enables uh, major and specialty publications to uh, reproduce your articles um, with full attribution to you and your institution. We've had tremendous success at Brock with that. Uh, a lot of our um, researchers' work has gone out that way, and um, it's uh, it's it's a really I, I encourage you to check it out. Um, and. Um, <clears throat> So the conversation, to write for the conversation, it's for current researchers, academics, those holding associate, adjunct, and honorary roles, and PhD students, or PhD candidates, rather, sorry. Um, if you're a master's student or uh, perhaps a PhD student, you would be working with your supervisor if you wanted to uh, write, write for the conversation. Um, and this... <clears throat> Next slide are just a few examples of articles from sport researchers uh, in different institutions across the country. So uh, do check it out uh, and, and see um, if this is something that you would like to get into. Okay, so um, now uh, I'm going to, um, the, the next uh, part of this presentation is taking the information and principles that Marianne was describing and kind of um, learning how we sort of apply them and how we work through them uh, through a process uh, from idea to uh, approaching media or to producing our own blog or op-ed piece or whatever it is. Uh, so, um, you know, whether it's through the conversation, a pitch to media, an interview, writing an op-ed or blog, any of those ways. Um, so you you have a, you may have a lot to say, and there's a lot of details in the research. It's very easy to kind of get lost in the details and and lost in in you know the 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 work that you're doing, um, and you've as Marianne has has um, uh, said, uh, you know there's you have a limited amount of time. You've got a limited a, 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 a amount of words to get your message across. Um, and uh, juggle, as journal, as Marianne also um, have, has said that journalists are one-stop shopping people. So they've got a lot on the go. They're juggling, um, which again, makes it great for us because they're much more willing to take, uh, if we thought about, we, if we packaged our message well, and if we thought about it, and if it's accessible to them and to their audience, oh, they're very happy to take it. I remember when I was a journalist way, way back, once upon a time, we, you know, we were kind of suspicious when uh, organizations packaged things and gave it to us. And now we're now I, I suspect that uh, journalists are saying thank you very much because <laughs> they've got so much on the go. Um, <clears throat> so um, so we're going these next few exercises are going to walk you through the process of identifying and fine tuning your message. Um, now, these um, uh, these exercises that we're doing are specifically geared for academics pursuing research. Um, I do understand that there are that there are some people. There may be some people today who aren't necessarily in uh, universities or academic institutions who may be with sport organizations. Um, so, whenever you see the word research, you can uh, substitute that for your organization or your work, um, and whatever you want the public to know about. Uh, for instance. An accomplishment of your organization or a service or event that your organization is providing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I have modified my speech a bit, but if, but just you can just uh, tailor it to your own situation. Okay, so the very uh, the what we want to do. Um, and again, Marianne uh, uh, touched on this, and I really want to reiterate the message is that, in my opinion. Um, 
successful communications, especially when you're communicating about research or whatever it is that you're communicating about, it's it's really important to have a very solid uh, basic core from which you uh, derive your inspiration, you derive your direction. Um, it, this, this core is what guides you. It keeps you focused. It keeps you on track. It's, it's kind of like a skeleton that you can use to add on to, uh, you know, the details as you craft your message. So we're going to do an exercise that on the surface may seem simplistic, but this will help you build your core. Um, now, I want you to take out a sheet of paper <clears throat> and as simply as you can, um, write anywhere from three to five sentence answers for each of the three questions on the slide. So what is your research or, or work about? Why are you doing it? And what would you like to see occur, occur as a result of your research or your work? And we'll take we'll take a few minutes to do this, three or three or so minutes to do that. So, uh, please uh, please go ahead with that. So we'll just give it another uh, 20 or 30 seconds ago. Uh, it's interesting when we're in person, it's easy to tell when people have wrapped up, but it's hard to tell online. But uh, yeah, we'll just give it another, another few, few seconds. Okay, um, <clears throat> so now what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to um, think of something that you want people to know about that comes from your research or from your work. Um, now, depending on how far you are with your research process, maybe the field in general, your classes, your organization, anything like that. Um, what you think is important that the public should know about in the area that you're in. Um, so try to picture this research finding or this insight or this knowledge or any of the uh, anything else in the form of a news or feature story in mainstream media. And imagine that you'd like a journalist to cover this story, or you'd like to communicate it yourself through writing a blog for the conversation or for something else. So let's take another minute or two. And what I would like you to do underneath the question, questions that you answer is write a three to five sentence story idea um, or, or a pitch 
to, that you that you would send to media outlets or that could serve as a very basic outline for a blog that you would write. Okay, <clears throat> I'm, I'm trying to judge from the face as I see whether it's time to move on or whether we need a little bit more time. I'm staring at Kyle. He looks like he's writing vigorously. So huh, I don't know if I do you want another uh, few seconds or are we good to go or uh, he's waving at me. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So um, <clears throat> So if you just uh, put that sheet of paper aside for now, and uh, we'll we'll get back to that uh, later in the presentation. All right, moving right along. Uh, preparing your message, know your audience. So when we're producing research or anything else that we do on the job or wherever we are, we do so in a lab, a classroom, a small group, an office, you know, in a particular setting where we are all, you know, sort of on the same page in terms of the way we think, the way we do things, the language we use, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's easy, it could be relatively easy to communicate with one another in that particular setting, but getting our researches or research organizations, or research or organizations results and insights and information out into the public beyond our immediate circles requires some pretty big mind shifts. And um, Two of these, I think, are the two of these really important mind shifts are, are the use of plain language and meeting your audience's needs. So <clears throat> these next few exercises are designed to illustrate these concepts when pitching to media, when being interviewed, when you're writing an op-ed or a blog, or any other uh, of the communications methods that uh, Marianne was talking about. Okay, so in one moment, we're going to break out into groups of four. And uh, groups of three or four, actually, it depends on, I don't know how many participants there are, and I don't know what makes sense. So either three people, four people, it doesn't, it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't matter, but um, you'll, you'll, you'll be in some kind of small group. Now, <clears throat> each, uh, the, the exercise that we're, the th three uh, exercises that we're going to do has three options to choose from. Um, so we've, we've uh, so as a group, you're going to um, decide on one of three options. Um, so the, you will decide as a group which option to pursue, but you will, as individuals, do what's written. So each person will do what's written here, but it will be the same. Everybody will do the same exercise. So it's not like individuals picking one option or whatever. You would decide. Now, the, the way that you pick this option, in part, would be would depend in part on like maybe where you're at with your research career. Um, maybe some people who are just starting out research or <clears throat> haven't even started research yet may pick one option over someone who has started or someone who's deep into their research and they're actually at the point of wanting to communicate their research, in which case they can use this exercise as a way of um, uh, simulating the process of what they would go through eventually, you know, very soon when they uh, communicate their research to a wider audience. So you, that's why I'm giving you three options and you as a group decide which you want to pick and everybody does the same. So the three options are 
Um, <clears throat> each person would come up with a story idea in your field of research or work. And you imagine that you're pitching this idea to a group of your peers um, for a specialized journal for a, a very specialized audience. So I want you to write a three to five sentence description of your story idea, but you wanna make sure that you, you put lots of terms, lots of fancy language, lots of jargon. You, you're writing to impress your peers. You want your peers to go, wow, this is a great idea, right? Um, so pick that one or, or each of you go to an academic journal that you're most familiar with and you select an abstract, but make sure there's lots of heavy language there um, that you understand, but that maybe other people in your group wouldn't understand. Um, so now with, okay, so when I do this in person, it's a little bit different, like, but depending on the composition of your group, if for some reason you it's it's a situation where all all of all three or four of you are in the same class, you're totally in the same page, you're from the same office, if it happens to be like that, then just try to, oh, sorry, I've jumped the gun. Ignore what I just said. Okay, option number three. Sorry about that. So download and read as much of this journal article as possible. So there's a link there. And this uh, this is going to be put into Google Docs. So when you're in your actual group, you can uh, look at this again uh, and, and take the link from that if you decide on, on option number three. So um, actually, uh, okay. So actually, Marianne, if you skip to the next slide, then I can explain the next part of the uh so after doing um, that for five minutes, uh, what you're going to do is uh, you're, there's the second part, part of this exercise is that <clears throat> amongst yourself, you're going to select with option number one, you're going to set, select one person to read their story idea out loud. Now, again, preferably the other members are not in the immediate fields or are unfamiliar. Um, and, and so I want what, what I want the people, the other people to do is to write down what they think that their person that the person's idea is all about. So don't ask the present presenter to explain, don't Google, just use your best, uh, just take your best guess to write down what you think the person was trying to say. And the same for option number two. One person will read out the journal abstract that they chose. And uh again, um, don't ask, don't ask the person to explain, don't, you know, don't Google, nothing like that. Just try as much as you can to guess what uh, is being said. Um, and, and so with though, if for some reason it's, you happen to all be in the same field and you all happen to all be on the same page with this and you understand each other, then try to picture what it would be like for your mom or your grandma or your next door neighbor or somebody like that. Try, try to picture that in, in, in your head. Um, and then with option number three, you would download and read as much as possible of, of this CTV news article. And the link is there. And again, the link is in the Google Docs. So you would use that link to get to the article. And then um, after that, the, the step three, um, like Marianne, if you go to the next slide. Uh, so the step three, what you would do is after five minutes, you of that, you would just like exchange, you would talk about it. So, you know, group in options number one and two, uh, you know, the, the, the ones who tried to paraphrase the complicated stuff would uh, share their message. And then the person who, uh, you know, and then they, the person could say, oh, no, that's not my idea. I meant, you know, it was like this, or that's not what the abstract is about. It's about this or, or, oh, yeah, you got it. Or, you know, whatever, like you, you just kind of discuss it as a group, or you can, uh, you know, with option three, you can compare the journal article to the news article that came out. Oh, beautiful. Okay, everyone, we're one, one big happy family again, everyone. So this is good to see you all back. So uh, yeah, I'm going to open up the floor for a sec um to see if anybody wanted to share anything uh about uh your your group and the discussion like did did you if you do you have any insights or experiences about what it was like to present something that was very jargoning what was it like to listen to it and try to interpret it especially if you didn't understand it um what was it like to try to explain it um what would it be like for family members to hear it uh, uh any thoughts about comparing the uh journal article with the ctv news article anything like that anybody wants to, to share I, I can start. We we did Patty Gibson. Um, we did. Um, 
look at option three. And so we did, um, we attempted to get through the journal article. Um, I would like to go back and have another read actually. Um, and what we were talking about was um, the very difference in um, writing styles and obviously audiences, because the journal article assumes um, that you have a sociological background that you can actually understand um, some of the, the jargon, some of the technical um, terms that are actually used. Um, the term sport washing um, is one that I didn't realize had been around for so long. I've just picked it up over the last week and I'm somebody that actually studies sport events. So I'm not so sure that, <laughs> where, that, that I'm gonna have to have a look at that. But um, we also felt that the CTV uh, news um, article was obviously um, written for the general public. But we also felt that it had a more of a sensationalist um, angle to it, rather than I felt, or we felt that the, the author of the um, academic paper was much more balanced, I think, because um, he, he gave us the idea that sport washing has been typically associated with autocratic regimes, when in fact, um, you know, he's got this model that actually looks at um, autocratic versus democratic. So that was more of a balanced view. So mm -hmm. any other thoughts, um, team? <laughs> Is that about it? I think that summarized what we were thinking. Oh, that's Thank you very much, Heather. That's great. That's great. And, and um, uh, was there any observations about, um, for instance, the, the terminology like, um, uh, you know, the, 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 when, when the journal article was explaining the concept of uh, sport washing as opposed to when the article itself kind of uh, tried to, you know, give a definition of, of, of sport washing was, did you find one uh, particularly, like, what, what did you think in comparison to those two definitions, let's say? Kathy, are you asking us or any or anybody? Oh, uh, no, no, I was asking you in particular, but anybody okay. can chime in, whoever did option number three, um, if, if they wanted to. Um, I think the um, in the CTV um, news um, article, um, and I think that's where our kind of idea of balance um, came from, that the definition was much more focused on the human rights um, um, case related to Qatar. When in fact, once you go into the um, academic paper, you can see from the different case studies that um, sport washing had been used in a different way. So mm -hmm. I got as far as when he presented his model and he had, you know, um, London 2012 and Salt Lake City there under the democratic process. And I was kind of intrigued to go further to find out what that message is compared to human rights. Because we know that human rights was part of the, um, the um, discussion around Beijing um, 2008, as well as um, Qatar in particular. And we know that it wasn't um, around Salt Lake City and um, London. We know that Salt Lake City, there was scandal. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if that's what that was about. And London 2012 was probably failure <laughs> in, the mega, in the legacy, not as an event, it was a fantastic event, but failing in the, um, not achieving the public health outcomes that they wanted, that they stated as part of their legacy. But I don't know that's what he picked up on. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Heather. And in fact, that's that's an interesting, all of this, that's a very interesting dimension that you bring in because then uh, the, we, the journal article and then the popular, the, the, the uh, wider audience article. And, and again, it, it's there's different focuses and there's different. Uh, so because going back to what Marianne was saying in the beginning, near the beginning, again, because Qatar is so much in the news now, it's an interesting the, the concepts in the journal were sort of applied in this article, you know, that was meant to use uh, the research findings or research thoughts uh, and apply it in a context that was unfolding. So that's that's an interesting observation that you made, Heather, you and your group made, Heather. That's great. Um, anyone else? Uh, any other? of the other groups, um, uh, is particularly ones who had a story idea of their own uh, or, or uh, found a, like a complicated journal abstract that other people were trying to, 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 uh, to interpret. Oh, okay, Laurel. Hi. Hey, Laurel, yay. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll share our experience. So we looked at um, an article called You Belonged to Something, and it was about... Um, participatory sport and being part of fundraising teams. And um, when, uh, just gonna remember my team member's name, 
Huang Zhao um, shared it and it almost seemed a little bit simplistic at the beginning, but then once we started kind of really talking through what some of the terms meant, it's a lot of the terms just aren't as plain of language, even in, even when we kind of thought that maybe it was plainer language, that it it really isn't and that some of the even participatory sport isn't, uh, yeah, maybe as plain language as we may think. So really taking some of those terms that we think are common language and making sure that the interpretation of them is um, accessible to, to more people and that we're not just assuming that people understand all the words that we're using. That's very interesting, Laurel. Um, and what was your experience um, when, when you came across this term and you were questioning sort of this term? What was your experience about that, like about what you went through when you were questioning the term and you were kind of trying to figure it out? Um, yeah, I guess thinking of how, um, well, like, yeah, the question was posed by you to the group, like, how would you explain it to your mom if your mom's not a scientist? Um, and just to to try to get people to care about the articles or, or, or about the the subject matter in general so that it is, um, so that people dig a little bit deeper. Great, thank you, Laurel, fantastic, mm -hmm. very good. Anyone else? Okay. Okay, very good. Oh, that's that's terrific. Um, yeah, so um, the, the exercises that we went through um, is demonstrating two principles of communicating to a, a wider audience. And I mentioned those a little bit earlier when I was first uh, uh, introducing these, these um, uh, exercises. So, of course, the first one is the use of plain language. And as Laurel was saying, um, and as many of you observed, it's it's very obvious to say, you know, use simple non-specialist language when communicating with a broad audience. Um, that that seems to be like a no-brainer. But um, once you know, especially if you're in the if you're in the academic field, and especially when you're first starting out, um, or when we're further along in the process in the academic field, there are a number of obstacles to overcome. And it, the, the obstacles, some of the obstacles are listed on on the, the slide in front of you. And the reason why. I'm bringing this up is what you know depending on who I'm giving the workshop to especially people who've been in the field for a while it is very difficult uh the longer you've been in the field let's say or when you're first starting out and you want to you know uh, you want to impress your colleagues it's very difficult to break out of the mindset of of simplifying language um you know and I found this a lot with my work uh at at, at Brock um there's always that fear of what your colleagues will think uh you know there's this fear that you're dumbing down this there's all these different um mindsets that people have um that you know, or maybe you you don't think you're an expert or you're it's it's not it's outside of your very immediate uh field all all of these kinds of things may go through your head um, and may stop you from, uh, you know, participating in media or or getting your message out there. And, and I, this is just basically to, um, uh, you know, to really solidify Mar Marianne's earlier point that, you know, you are the expert and we do, you know, it's it's really good for you to get out there and to, to talk about your work, to talk about your research. Um, so when you enter the world of media relations and all of a sudden you are communicating with people from all different walks of life, educational backgrounds, interests, um, you know, you're, you need to be, you, sometimes you may need to be willing to, do, to sacrifice a certain very small degree of precision for another word that maybe is not as precise and focused, but still gives the basic meaning across or else, or, or otherwise you risk losing people and they just kind of, their eyes glaze over and they go on to something else. Um, so yes, yeah, so to connect with the public, you need to use plain language. So what is plain language? Um, now there's a million definitions out there. Um, I, I chose a particular one for this 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 slide. Uh, so contrary to what people in to, so what some in the academy may say, it's not dumbing down. Like you're not uh, making things less intelligent because you 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 know you want to make things simpler. Um, plain language is communications your audience can understand the first time they read it or they hear it. And uh, written material is in plain language if your audience can find what they need to know, understand what they need to know, and use this information to meet their needs. 
So then um, getting into the do's and don'ts of plain language, uh, you know, don't use jargon or highly specialized language. Um, so again, there, you, you, you may need to go through a process, uh, and we did this through, through our, within, with our small group actually, of taking a term and breaking down that term or translating that term into uh, words that are fairly common that, that people understand. Um, I know that when I do Brock news stories, I often Google scientific terms and I keep Googling down, keep Googling down, Googling down until I can come up with phrases or concepts that I can translate. And then when I take it back to uh, the person who I'm doing the story with, they can check to see if it's, if it's, if it's, within a certain degree of accuracy that people, so a wide audience can understand as opposed to a very narrow scientific audience. Um, so if you Google, if you Google terms, um, chances are that someone out there has figured out a way to say what you wanna say. And I'll get to that in a second in the next slide. But anyway, um, yeah, uh, do explain, if you if you need to, to use a technical term or an acronym, explain what it is right away. Um, you know, be aware of your audience's uh, education level. We have something called a FOG index. I don't know if anyone's uh, familiar with that, but apparently it's a scientific calculation as to the level of the average grade level of the average reader. And it's something like I think it's like grade seven or grade eight, according to this fog. And, and this fog index is like a program that you can use. You plug in some of your terms uh, and then they can tell you what, how much education you need to, to have to understand the term. So um, yeah, so uh, you know, make, your, make your speech and writing uh, active, um, not, not abstract, uh, don't use a passive voice uh, um, and try to pay, paint a picture with your words. Um, I don't have an example specifically now, but you know, sometimes when I come across articles, I, I see very interesting ways that uh, scientists use uh, different images to paint pictures. Like I remember a long time ago, I did a story um, with one of the scientists here. Um, and he talked about uh, these strands, I think they were DNA strands or so, some strands of something coming together like like uh, like spaghetti and then uh, you know joining together to form a particular you know lump uh, from these spaghetti strands and like just just the way that you know he he talked about it I could very vividly picture in my head this biological process that was happening. So so try as much as you can to do that. Um, the next slide um, uh, you know, we, we, you want you you want to think about the tone um, of, of your uh, of your communications. So um, you know, be be sort of on the more a little bit on the formal side, but conversational at the same time. So, uh, and you can vary that too. Like if depending on again, depending on your audience, you know, you can be a little bit less formal. You can be uh, you can use certain expressions. What we're, whoever you're writing to, uh, and it is very important to know who it is that you're writing to. Um, and just, you know, even with terms that are not all that complicated and that a lot of people understand, you still can make it, you know, even more understandable. Cognition, thinking, disseminate, give, distribute, send out, uh, expeditious, fast, quickly. Um, um, and, and when you're talking about your research, uh, and we we encountered this in our in our in our small group. Um, you know, make sure that you explain the scientific term, like the the methods. Like so, for instance, uh, instead of saying that we've done a longitudinal study, because maybe not a lot of people are familiar with longitudinal study, we did a long term study. We did a study over time. We, you know, it's the lead researcher. Um, it's the teaching method we use as opposed to the pedagogy. That that kind of thing. Um, now, on that last point. Uh, if you Google the term plain language dictionary, uh, you'll get a lot of resources out there that will help you translate complicated and even not so complicated words into their, into accessible language. Um, I, I find uh, plainlanguage.gov particularly helpful, but there is many others out there that you can use. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, now what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to return to the page where you described your research and your story idea, the, 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 question, the questions you answered in the, uh, the, the beginning of, of um, uh, the beginning of this section. So I want you to reread the answer to, to your first three questions. That is, what is your research or work about? Why are you doing it? And what would you like to see occur as a result of your research or work? Um, 
So I, I want you to just kind of, you know, using what we've discussed so far and, and what you've learned so far, just um, if you need to make it a little bit simpler, if it, if it was a little bit uh, sort of heavier language in the beginning, just take a minute or two to kind of, if you need to rewrite it a little bit, to make it a little bit more simple and, and try to sharpen your focus. Um, you know, try to kind of get another layer, like try to get to the very basics. Um, so try to reduce your answers to about one or two sentences from three to five sentences. And to help you do that a little bit, um, you probably in the noble knowledge mobilization uh, session that my colleague uh, Jane Morris um, gave, uh, she may have had a slide or she may have referred to the concept of Smith and Blam. Um, and, and you know, usually with communications, there's a single most important thing that you want to get across to uh, whoever is uh, reading or hearing your communication or and the bottom line actionable message. Like, what is it that you want to occur uh, as a result of your communication? So we'll just uh, we'll just give about two minutes or so. Uh, just go back and uh, look at your answers again and make um, refinements, you know, re refine the answers to the first three questions. Okay, it looks like um, most people, uh, you can always go back to this after uh, if, you, if you need more time um, to, to kind of sharpen your focus. So just uh, put that aside for now. We'll get back to it uh, a little bit later. Okay, so um, the second principle that these exercises demonstrate is the important of importance of connecting with your audience. Um, and uh, so I, I put a picture of the Winston, who I call the Winstons. It's a file shot, but um, these are these are the people who you're trying to, who you may be trying to reach. Um, I know that I, when I was a journalist, I found it very helpful to picture specific people in my mind when I was writing what I was writing, and that might be helpful for you as well. Um, so be, before identifying your audience or getting a sense of your audience, you, you want to figure out, uh, you want to get in very clear in your own mind what you hope to achieve by communicating the story of your research or your work to a wider audience. Um, I just have a few examples, you know, on the slide uh, in front of you there. Um, you know, whatever, whatever your goal or goals are uh, in getting your message across, um, it is, it, you know, it's, it's, it's good to have a very clear understanding of, of that because that will help shape the message that, and, and how you want to say it. Um, then the next, after you've, you've got a really strong sense of that, the next question becomes, how does your research relate to broader society? And so why should people care about your research findings, your insights, uh, the accomplishments that your organization has, has, uh, has seen, et cetera, et cetera. And um, a number of years ago, I attended a tri-agency communications conference and um, one of uh, one of uh, one, the then education editor of the Global Mail, uh, Simona Choice, had given a presentation. The title of the presentation was it, "What is it that makes research stories and education work for us?" And here's what she said. So timely, um, and again, Marianne has gone quite into detail about that. So what's happening in the news? Uh, how can you connect your work and your results to you know broader things in society? What's being uh, talked about? So personal, science that you can use. Um, uh, surprising, uh, something that's counterintuitive, something that makes us curious, you know, to like something that you, that's not obvious. You think, oh, I always thought blah, blah, blah. And now this study is saying blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, crucial, speaking to pe people's immediate concerns. So if, uh, you know, at local, speaking to audiences in different parts of the country. So for instance, last weekend, the, the beautiful snow dump that we got, we might want to talk about it to an expert about, oh, is this a sign of global, you know, climate change? Is this normal? Is this, why is this dump happening in, in my neck of the woods? Um, controversial, uh, not just, uh, you know, not just situations, but a clash of ideas or information. You have a piece of the puzzle with your research, your expertise, your experience that contributes to a wider debate um, and or a new view on an existing problem, which, you know, uh, continues the conversation. Um, so these are some of the criteria that you can keep in mind that can help guide you on how to connect your work with what's happening in the wider society. Um, now go back to the page that you just put aside uh, a minute ago and 
using um, this slide that's displayed right now and, and all the stuff that we've, uh, you know, that we've discussed, make a list of five reasons. Now, now go to the story idea that you created. Uh, so not the questions, you've dealt with the questions already, but the story idea that you created that arises out of your research or, or out of your work. And um, look at your story idea again that you were going to pitch or that you're going to write a blog about. And make a list of five reasons why your audience should care about your story idea. And we'll just take a minute or two to, 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 to make to do that. Okay, um, I'm just looking at the time, and I'm realizing that uh, we're, we're uh, so I'm, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna speed things up a little bit because Marianne still has a few more comments, and we still want time for questions and discussions. So um, I will uh, pick up the pace a little bit. Uh, so then, um, at the same conference, um, there was a CBBC producer uh, panel, and the uh, theme was "Make it real, people. Make it real, people, meaningful." So. Um, just talking about, uh, you know, that about a, a, a study that should make you exclaim, wow, that's interesting. Wow, that's new. Wow, that's something I've never heard of. Um, so then what what you can do then with your story idea, um, and I, we can, we, you can do this actually on your own time because I realize that time is running. So, um, uh, you know, after this or on your own time, go back to your story idea and pick one uh, pick one reason why your your um, audience should care about your story, and then shorten your story idea to just one or two sentences. Uh, so yeah, so we'll, we'll um, you can you can do that a little bit later. I'll move on to the next sec section. So just a quick summary of of key points on this slide of uh, you know everything that we've covered, um, and uh, I think that um, you'll probably get a copy of the presentation, I guess, right? Or at least the recording. So you can go back to the recording if you wanted to just kind of spend some more time on the key points. Okay. Um, the last little bit of what I'm going to do, and that's it segues into Marianne's, um, uh, you know, the conclusion of Marianne's uh, portion is that um, uh, I just want to touch very briefly on the interview, delivering the message to the interview. So uh, Marianne's going to talk all about the process and how to prepare for it, et cetera. What I just want to do is I just want to give a very quick overview of why we do interviews, why journalists do interviews in the first place. So um, uh, on this slide, the, the points on the next few slides come from a blog, a blog written by Joe Bunting. He's an author. And I, I've just kind of adopted this for research uh, context. So, um, you know, that so journalists want to talk to you uh, to um, uh, the four W's and H, who, what, why, and how to get details, general information about a subject matter. Um, on the next slide, um, they may want to con convey the personality behind the research or the event or the issue or whatever it is that you're saying, uh, putting a face to the story. Um, uh, some niche uh, media outlets in particular could feature research they think will help their followers. Uh, and, um, you know, the next slide, the interviewee's uh, firsthand account contributes a particular perspective to a situ situation or issue. Um, and then to achieve balance, fairness, and objectivity in the resorts journal in the reports, journalists want to ensure a, a, a number of different voices are heard. So that's sometimes why um, you know an expert or a researcher comes into the story is they they can provide like a bigger picture view or a bit of balance to the story. Um, and because the audience will love it. So we're uh, media is always wanting to give their audiences something that they couldn't give on their own. So hence the interview. And with that, we slide back into Marianne. Thanks, Kathy. Um, so, you know, once you've reached out to media and you have secured yourself an interview, uh, what do we do now? 
Um, there are a few key things that I would recommend, um, especially for television or radio interviews. Um, put your phone on silent. I, I know that may seem like an obvious one, but it's a very important one. Um, hang a do not disturb sign on the door uh, lock the door if possible. I would advise uh, if you are working from home with which many of us are these days um, to let anybody else in your house know that you are going into either a live or recorded interview and perhaps just encourage them um, to to uh, hang tight while you uh, while you move forward. Um, I will quickly play uh, uh, I'm sure some of you may be familiar with one of the most famous uh, uh, moments. Uh, this happened pre-COVID, which is hilarious because now we can all relate to this. Um, but this gentleman did not lock his door uh, and likely did not have a sign up. So um, just just to be mindful. I don't scandals happen all the time. The question is, how do democracies respond to those scandals? Uh, and what will it mean for uh, for the wider region? I think one of your children has just walked in. I mean, shift, shifting shifting sands in the region. Do you think relations with the north may change? Um, I would be surprised if they do. The, um, pardon me. Pardon me. My apologies. What was this going to be for the region? My apologies. North, uh, sorry. Um, North Korea, North, uh, South Korea's policy choices on North Korea have been severely limited in the last six months to a year because. So, scandals happen all oops, sorry so our uh, our friend Robert Kelly was probably giving one of the biggest interviews of his life um, of his professional career with the BBC um, and unfortunately that is how it played out luckily for him I think it did uh, you know it did put a, a bit of a spotlight on him in a positive way um, and people can definitely relate to this these days um, I think it was a little bit different when this incident initially happened um, but now that we've all had some time uh, dealing with Zoom and, and uh, learning how all of that works, um, I, I think that uh, we can relate to it a little bit more. But all of that to say, please, please, please uh, just let people in your house know that you are doing interviews. Um, you don't want to be Robert Kelly. We want the focus on your research and not on the people walking into the background of your interviews. Um, also, just recommend have a look in the mirror. Never hurts to do that quick check. Um, and also, because a lot of these interviews are taking place over Zoom these days, just be mindful of what is in the background behind you. Um, you know, if you're going to use a, a blur filter or, uh, you know, it, depending on your angle, just have a quick look at it, pull it up, just see what you can see, make sure everything's clear. Um, because if you can see it, so can the public. And if there's something back there that you don't want them to see, it's best to just have a, a quick, a quick look through. So. So acing the interview, um, you know, you've got yourself an interview, now what? Uh, it's great to be able to introduce yourself to the reporter um, for name pronunciation. So if you have a name that typically people do have difficulty pronouncing properly, um, please offer that information in, uh, in advance. Uh, you know, introduce yourself, give them the proper pronunciation. Reporters are not uh, looking to purposely do these things incorrectly. They will very much appreciate if you give them that advance notice this is how you correctly pronounce my name um, they they will definitely appreciate that little uh, that little bit of advice um, if you are doing radio or television ask if this if the segment is live or if it's being recorded if it is being recorded um, and you know you begin to answer uh, a question but you're not quite happy with the way that you answered it don't be afraid to ask to give it another go um, there is nothing wrong with that it won't always be a possibility but if it's a recorded interview, um, there's certainly nothing wrong with saying, you know, I, I think I'd like to give that another try. Um, and in most cases, you will be able to do that. Um, avoid reading from notes when possible. Uh, this goes for, you know, radio, television, um, even with print interviews. Uh, it's not great to read from notes, but it's okay to have like a bulleted list that you can refer to. Sometimes it's nice to just be able to have those key points. Uh, that you can make sure that you um, that you can review just so that you're not missing anything once once the interview has wrapped. Um, in terms of actually conducting the interview, it's the best interviews are ones that are conversational. So there's a bit of back and forth. Um, you know, they'll ask a question. 
you can answer it, um, but don't feel the need to rush and fill silence. We do find uh, sometimes, you know, when people are asked a question, they, uh, they will answer it. But then as soon as there's a moment of dead air, there's just that kind of prompt to keep talking. Um, don't be afraid to leave that little bit of space. Let them follow up with another conversation or another question. This way you can have that back and forth. Um, that, that's when the best interviews take place is, you know, when both people are engaged. Um, ultimately, this is a conversation. But I will also mention, um, please always rec remember that you are on the record um, when those conversations are taking place. Um, so be mindful of, uh, of that as well. Okay, so um, should you encounter some issues while you are uh, in the midst of an interview, if somebody, uh, if a journalist asks you something that you are not comfortable asking, it's okay to say that. Um, it's okay to redirect. Um, it's okay to try and redirect the conversation back to an area that you are comfortable with. Um, it can really help to get the interview back on track if it's headed too far in the wrong direction. Sometimes, you know, they may ask a, a, a secondary question about something and it's not within your realm of expertise and it's okay to guide them back to an area that you are comfortable speaking to. Um, there is nothing wrong with that. Um, and again, if the interview is uh, is not live and you don't like the way you've answered a question, um, ask if you can if you can try uh, try that again. So if you find yourself wanting to share something that you don't want included in the pro the final product, um, don't ask a journalist to go off the record. Uh, it's really best to just keep that information to yourself. So it's it's a common belief that when someone tells a reporter something is off the record, that means the reporter can't can't print it, um, can't sh share it publicly. You know, it's very easy to be in the middle of a conversation like this and say, "Oh, wait, off the record," and then to throw a little nugget of information out there. Um, realistically, the reporter has to agree to those terms, and even then, there are no guarantees. So just because you say off the record does not mean that that is technically off the record. They need to agree to that. Um, so it's just best to err on the side of caution. And, you know, if, if it's something you're not sure you should be saying, perhaps just, just keep it to yourself. Leave it, leave it internal. <laughs> so you finish your interview. Now what? Um, feel free to reach out to the reporter, thank them. Um, it's also a great opportunity to offer further assistance. So if you're dealing with a complex topic, uh, you know, let them know I'm available. If you have additional questions, please reach out. If clarification is needed, um, it's a really good way to just solidify, you know, if you're not sure, please reach out to me. This is this is one that we get asked a lot, and I did reference um, earlier in the presentation, but don't ask to see the story before it's published. Um, when you are working with traditional media outlets, um, that is just not something that most media outlets will do for you. Um, the, we do get we ask, we get asked a lot um, about whether it is appropriate, uh, and here's why it's not. So reporters abide by professional journalistic standards. Um, you know, they're, they're striving to provide accurate, unbiased, and balanced news coverage. In, when you allow a source to view that story prior to publication, there's a lot of potential to have that pro final product influenced, um, which alleviates the ability to provide that balanced and unbiased coverage. Um, it can really significantly disrupt the integrity of the process. Um, so the answer nine times out of 10 would be no, um, which is why generally we recommend that you you don't ask in the first place. Um, when you're working with a communications team like at the university or something along those lines, then it's totally fine. Uh, you know, most times you won't even need to ask. They will provide you the story in advance for you to have a look at. But when you're working with um, like actual journalists and media outlets, um, it's best to to not go that route. If something does get published and there is an error in it, um, you know, go to go to your communications team, work with your communications professionals. They will reach out to get the error corrected when possible. Um, if you do decide that you want to contact the reporter directly, you know, you've had a little bit of back and forth with them, um, you know, just reach out and be polite, please. That's all that we ask. Um, you know, we're we're still working to to build these relationships with. Uh, with uh, these journalists and um, we want to continue to work with them in the future. 
in most cases, it, it's not a purposeful error and they'll be happy to correct it. Um, so that won't be an issue, but, uh, but we, all, we are also there to, to help on your behalf. All right, so the most important thing to note, um, which again, we've mentioned a couple of times, is just that there are communication specialists out there to help you. Um, they are there to provide you support before, during, and after your interactions with the media. Um, so please take advantage of that whenever you can. Does anybody have any questions? I realize that's uh, a very general statement at the end of a very long presentation and we are very tight for time, um, but happy to answer any and to, to take any via email if we can assist post, post, uh, post session as well. I see Emily. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, that was uh, really informative um, and really engaging. I uh, really gained a lot from this session, so thank you. Um, I just had a quick question about kind of the power of the researcher or storyteller or the positionality. And we, um, you did mention, uh, Kathy, a little bit about like, you know, knowing yourself and like knowing kind of your own position. I think that's what the exercise is about. And I just wonder if you could speak a little bit more to kind of that awareness of how like who you are will have an impact on how that message is received by particular audiences. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> thank you for the question. Um, yeah, that's an excellent point actually. And that's why, um, <clears throat> you know, self-awareness is, is so important, uh, not only for getting your message across, but for life in general. <laughs> so um, yeah, um, you know, I, uh, um, Hmm, let's see. I'm, my mind's kind of gone blank here. Um, just, yeah, just, just, just really to be grounded in. I mean, I think the most important thing is to really be grounded in uh, the, the 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 conviction of your work, the um, uh, knowing knowing your work and how it relates uh, to society, the difference that you want to make. Um, and from there, uh, you can work on communication skills. There's, you know, there's exercises you can do. There's, there's training and there's, there's, uh, you know, but I mean, I think the most successful research communications in my experience are those that in which society as a whole can use what it is that you're generating. Um, so to be awareness of that, to be aware of that and, and your role in society and everybody around you, I think, I think those are, 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 are important things when you, when you're in communications, you yeah. know. I, I hope I answered your question, uh, but if not, we can talk more uh, offline, but I, yeah. Okay, good, thanks. Awesome, well, I see we're very close to time, so uh, we will hang out if people have more questions and wanna chat a little bit more. I'm happy to hang out here and just uh, chat off the record, actually off the record.